what I mean I, I, I think that's covered very well by Isabel let me just um, say that I agree with the fact that we need both risk sharing and market discipline right um, so, and, and of course combining the two perspectives is it, and, and they don't they just complement it's absolutely right they, they're complementary they don't they con don't contradict each other although in politics we hear we hear that the thing that you know the German and the French politicians sort of come with those perspectives and they seem, seem to think that these are these are uh, contradictory and they're not and it's it's good to see you know, a, group, a group of economists making that that point from the two countries so these are the uh, various uh, areas the six areas of reforms and I'm, I'm only going to talk about the financial architecture also so I, we don't have time to talk more about that I'm not sure I have much to say about that um, so my main question is this is this sufficient and I'm going to argue that it is. Right. Um, I'm starting from this point. But uh, monetary unions are strong as the weakest link. Right? So starting starting from the very perspective of France and Germany, risks losing something. It's the risk losing the periphery, basically. Right? Um, so EMU is, isn't just France and Germany. There's lots of other countries. Um, the proposals are, are good in general, but I, I fear that the discussion of um, issues like bail-in doesn't really take into consideration the problems, the reason we have problems with bail-in, right? They sort of propose some solutions, but without those solutions are sort of, um, um, they are again rules, right? To prevent those problems. But I think we need to understand understand what what is the cause of those the problems with bail-in right and and I think in order to understand them you really need to look carefully at what has happened in the periphery where these things have been used and what were the problems right and of course the countries that I'd like to, to look at and I've been studying of course partly because I was in Cyprus or during the crisis but also I followed what's happening elsewhere and it's pretty similar actually Slovenia, right. also Latvia. And I mean, one, the, so basically there are three risks. I'm sorry, I didn't mention them already. So the first risk that I see, besides the, bail, the issue of bail in, is the erosion of central bank independence that I, I talked about earlier. And this is systemic, it's not just one or two countries. The second is, is, the, is the fallout, the political fallout from the use of bail in. And this is where the problems arose from political fallout and I think it's happened in three countries at least that I know of and Italy it has happened and that's partly why they they put back in Italy right because they used it there was some reaction and then they just thought oh goodness but the third one which I haven't talked about yet and maybe surprise or shock you even um, is illicit financial flows and they're very much in the news recently right dirty money flowing around a lot of it and it's not just Cyprus, right? And it's not just Malta, but it's also Netherlands, it's in BBC, and, uh, and uh, ING, right? And Denmark, right? You wouldn't have thought. Um, but, you know, lots of countries. And in the UK, actually, the UK today announced some, some uh, um, I think there's some uh, news about um, addressing that problem in the UK. But I will explain why these are important. I mean, central bank independence is absolutely the, at the very heart of the union. And the crisis has revealed the limitations of central bank independence. I mean, that's just the foundation, right? So what was partly related to bail-in, in fact, and bank failures, right? Because who were the institutions that did resolution? In countries like Cyprus, I mean, I didn't want to do resolution, but they said to me, well, you are the most independent institution, the central bank, right? And you have the expertise. No one else can do it. And that's the Troika coming to us and saying, you have to be the resolution authority. In most countries, it is a central bank that is the resolution authority, right? So, and that's highly political, highly toxic. So what has happened is that people lost money, in some cases a lot of money, and they went to politicians, they organized themselves, 
and that has created a huge fallout, and a lot of that has fallen on the institutions that did their dirty work for Europe, right? They didn't do it for themselves. They did it to stabilize their banking systems and to keep the euro area uh, as a monetary union. Now, the similar case, the similar attacks in other countries, in Portugal, the Banco Espirito Santo case was one in which it led to a lot of political fallout on the central bank and on Carlos Costa, the governor himself. Um, in Greece, the situation is slightly different, but there have been um, systematic attacks against Yanis uh, Sturnaras from the Syriza government. In Latvia, they went a step further. And of course, there you might say there are corruption allegations in Latvia. But the governor was removed in literally three days. Now, for someone who's independent, is protected by the treaty. To remove the governor in three days with one judge on the basis of some corruption allegation. Maybe they're true, I don't know. But that's just shocking, right? And it took the ECB about, I think, a couple of months before they actually said, yes, we are going to apply to the European Court of Justice to examine whether this is in contravention of the treaty or not. Meanwhile, Rusevich has been out of office, and I think he will be out of office until the end of his term. So that's one governor gone, and this was protected by the treaty, their independence. So you can imagine what that does to the rest of them. I, I just, I, I think the notion is not just those who you remove from office, it's how the rest of them behave afterwards. They just watch, you know, behind their backs. They wouldn't want to do anything that goes against the political consensus, right? Because they would risk their positions. Right? If this is what we mean by central bank independence. Back in the 1970s, there's an article in the Economist, I'm writing a new book on central bank independence, and I discovered this. It said, a, central, a, a good central bank is a central bank that can say no to politicians. And I think that's absolutely true. But I don't think that we can assume that this is going to continue happening in Europe, especially in the euro area. Even the ECB itself in Germany has been under attack because of all the non standard things it did do this sort of, uh, to keep the euro together, to do whatever it takes, right? So in fact, I was having discussions with Conrad Draghi at the time that I was having attacks. He says, oh, yes, Pani, because you're having attacks. Look at what they're writing about me, right? In the German press, on a daily basis. So okay, let's have a sympathy club here together, right? So it's, it's, it's unbelievable, actually, and it's systematic, right? And so it's quite, I don't think it's been recognized sufficiently. Um, now, the Commission is part of the problem, right? They took action against Hungary a few years ago. I think it was 2012, 13, uh, against, you know, Hungary. I mean, well, the violations of independence are so glaringly obvious. And within six months of starting the, the, the process, the procedure, the infringement procedure, they closed it on the basis of some promises that the Hungarian government made that we will respect the bank independence. So part of the problem is enforcement. The commission has been very unwilling, and the com it's the commission's responsibility to protect the bank independence. In my case, Mario Draghi wrote a letter to Barroso. I talk about that in my book. And, and of course, Barroso decided to have a quiet word with President of Cyprus, Anastasiadis. And of course, that did nothing, right? So the commission basically has failed to protect, to enforce the treaty. So I, I was somehow, well, I was very pleased with what's happening now with Hungary, but it's, I feel it's a bit too late and too little, right? Because it's all, it's all connected, I don't think, and it's political, basically. Right, and in legal terms, they, what the ECB could do is limited by the treaty. The treaty, when, when the ECB was established and the monetary union was established, the thought was the ECB would do monetary policy, right? Wouldn't do other things, resolution of banks, or the ECB, or supervision, or whatnot. So the independence of the ECB derives from monetary policy. So when things started happening to me, and I went to the ECB, and, I, and this is what they told me, well, our independence protects you in what you're doing on the governing council. So my immediate question was, 
why did you ask me to do bank resolution then? Right? And now you're saying that's not, we're not, we are in the gray area now. And in fact, um, even Mersch, who is in charge of law at the ACB, has written a, a couple of recent um, papers explaining this, which is, I mean, it's the lawyers in the ACB who wrote them. And, and, and it is true, this is where independence comes. It comes from monetary policy. So when it comes to supervision and the SSM, the guys who sit on the supervisory mechanism could be removed from office just like that, except for the ACB members. So they're not pro their independence is not protected. So there are some issues there. And I do think that when you have political control over, I mean, it, it is inevitably political, but unless you have independence, politicians are likely to take the, what is expedient in the short run. They would, you know, short term is, is not the best for dealing with banking problems, right? It's going to lead to forbearance, it's going to lead to financial instability, and eventually taxpayer bailouts. So we need to th rethink about um, that aspect. So bail-in, I mean, partly talked about. Um, we haven't thought about the, uh, who actually pays the bills, and it would be the investors, and they tend to be influential. In Cyprus, we had another unintended consequence that the new owners of Bank of Cyprus were Russian and Ukrainian oligarchs, most of them politically exposed people. So people were surprised by that, but you know that's what the deposits were, the insured deposits. And the question is, even if they are hedge funds, people think that you can bail in. There's one different solution. Who are the holders of those? Who are going to be the new owners? This is a question you need to ask yourself. Are they hidden proper? Would hedge funds be hidden proper to run banks? So I think bail in is new and it's a lot of research, basically. Um, and I think it, the Italian reactions were quite similar. And in Slovenia, we had similar to Cyprus. We had the central bank government was subjected to all kinds of um, investigations, police investigations, was seizure of documents, seizure of um, secret CB documents. And the governor faced death threats, eventually he resigned. He's now in Brussels uh, at the single resolution um, mechanism for board. Okay? So, and there are political incentives. Actually, this is even more interesting. There now is a process in both Slovenia and Cyprus to reverse the bailout. Right? Political process. In Cyprus, they call them the victims of Europe. These are the victims of Europe. These are not baby investors. The victims of Europe. So we have to compensate them. Right? But in Slovenia, they are basically appointing people on the central bank board whose banks had failed and were bailed in. Right? And there was an article in Bloomberg only yesterday. So people who are wouldn't qualify to be on, on boards of commercial banks are going to be on the same bank board. The third topic is illicit financial flows. And I think that's connected to politics. It's connected to corruption, of course, also, and rule of law. It is becoming a problem for the entire euro area. Once dirty money comes in, right, it doesn't matter where it comes in. It's in the single market. It's clean, right? It can do anything. It can be in London. It can be in Cyprus. It can be in France. It can be in Germany, right, once it comes in. And it, it doesn't, I mean, the kind of dirty money you're talking about is not dirty money that is just simply criminal. It's got a political purpose, right? And that political purpose is to influence elections, is to influence referenda, is to create instability. So um, I think that a lot needs to be done there. And we have, a, it, it's, it's pretty systematic. I'll just give you the example of Cyprus. Man, I didn't know these things. This came out from the Manafort trial. Paul Manafort, who was acting in Ukraine, right, for, for Yanukovych, um, he was using Cyprus. And uh, allegedly the law firm that was representing him is one of the top five politically connected law firms in Cyprus, former Minister of Justice, who had been recommended to him by a Russian oligarch to make the repasca, which ended the US sanction. Um, so Manafort did what Manafort did, and of course he ran uh, Donald Trump's campaign. There is still allegations, but I think those allegations are pretty, pretty strong. And we're going to see what, what actually this was election meddling. Um, now, Malta, we had similar situations, but not the same sort of level of, although a, a, um, a journalist was murdered, which I think is kind of, it's kind of scary. This is the European Union of rule of law. 
right? And this is Morton, over investigation of money laundering connected to the government. Um, okay, Part, what is the problem here? And it's not being addressed, I'm afraid, by the reform proposal. I think it should be addressed. Is that anti-money laundering regulation and supervision remains at the national level, right? Combine that with the, the national level, mostly is central banks. Right, in, Cy in countries like Cyprus, I'm not, I think Malta perhaps is not the central bank, Cyprus is, is the central bank. Um, so if these institutions no longer have independence over anything other than monetary policy, it is very easy for politicians to lean on them. And when there's already a lot of dirty money floating around to politically connected law firms, then there's a big risk, right? So that's why I'm suggesting, and I think others are saying this, we need a single European regulator for anti-money laundering, and we need it yesterday, right? We don't need it another 10 years. It would be too late 10 years, I think. Okay, the way forward is, first of all, you have to read my book. Mm -hmm. Excuse. And then the conclusions are there. Uh, I have some, some suggestions for, for strengthening central fund independence in the periphery by having uniform, harmonized procedures for members of the board. So you couldn't have, for example, what's happening now in Slovenia. Um, so we have the same rules for everyone. Then you can strengthen the boards. In fact, I do think that appointing external members of the boards would help. Right? Part of my problem as governor was I had a very hostile board against me. Right? And they were all appointed by the same government. And they were all trying to basically, um, well, constraining what I could do. The notion of independence actually includes financial independence. These guys control the board. So one of the things they told me is that, well, you're like a pilot. If you're in the sky, you can take the plane anywhere you like. But while you're on the ground, we decide whether to put fuel in your plane. And we may decide not to put any fuel at all. So you can, will always be grounded, right? This is what exactly they said to me. So financial independence, who govern without, you know, even if the treaty is protecting you, if you don't have financial independence, there's no budget basically for the government. It has to go through the board. So if these guys are captured, you'd go nowhere, right? Sorry to be giving you this, but this is more, more sort of nitty uh, gritty problems of existing problems of the current um, the current architecture which uh, SSM and SRM haven't addressed, and made worse, actually. Thank you. <laughs>